now so I don't forget. Um, before we jump into the topic for this week, I want to um, talk a little bit about the end of the semester. It's rapidly approaching. We are in week 14, and um, that means we just have the class meetings this week and next week before the final exam period starts. And you can see there, this is for specifically for the people in the face-to-face -face class. The online people are taking their exam online as they've done everything else online, although there will be a little bit of a difference, which I'm going to send out an email, uh, a uh, course message to you all. Yes, do you have a um, question? Is, is, is there something I should be seeing on the overhead? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't Thank tell. You. I'm sorry. Yep, I, keep, I always forget to do that. Thank you. You would think after 13 weeks, by the 14th week, I would remember to do that. Okay, so um, now you should see the course syllabus. And you're looking yes. at the course syllabus for the face-to-face -face class. Um, yours is a little bit different. Uh, what I was trying to say about the online people, to you, to the uh, couple of you who are with us this morning, that uh, you need to go out and check your syllabus because the date, time window for the final exam is obviously different than what I have here for the face-to-face -face class. Um, and I'll be posting an announcement to the course website as well, uh, providing some details. At any rate, what I wanted to say uh, about the schedule as we wind down, I was reflecting a little bit this morning. Actually, I have been doing this for about the last week, sort of mulling over uh, an idea. I've, I've tried to do uh, several things this semester that um, I've never really done in classes before. Um, certainly never given weekly reading quizzes and lecture quizzes that I think I told you at the very beginning of the semester was a new feature. Um, maybe I can get some feedback from you when we're done about, you know, how that, you know, works from your perspective. Um, uh, another thing, though, that um, I'm going to do, I'm, I think we ought to do, um, the thing that I've been uh, sort of tossing around the last week is what to do with week 15. I have on the schedule uh, indicated a uh, topic for week 15, or yeah, for week 15, uh, market interventions and macroeconomic stabilization. But as you know, next Tuesday, a week from today, and then a week from Thursday, we come in and we take our last quizzes, our last lecture quiz on Tuesday and our last lecture quiz on Thursday. And that's over the material for week 14, the material that we're covering this week in class for the lecture quiz and, of course, the reading assignment over chapter five uh, next a week from Thursday, right? Uh, so, in other words, we don't, we, won't, we don't have in the works a quiz either over the lecture material for week 15 or over the reading material for week 15, which actually didn't even put a reading assignment up there for you because even at, before the semester started, I was kind of anticipating that this was going to be a little bit of an issue for us. Um, bottom line is, we've already had you read chapter 16 uh, or very early in the semester. It was one of the, I think, around week three or something like that. So we've actually covered that material. We were just going to go into a little bit more depth in week 15. But Upon reflection, I've decided maybe we can make a little bit better use of that time, even though that's probably my favorite, one of my favorite uh, topics for this course. Um, I think I told you all at the beginning of the semester, I have a background in economics, and so why wouldn't I want to come in and talk about economic <laughs> policy issues? But um, since we're not quizzing over it, um, maybe we can use week 15 a little bit differently. And so here's what I'm going to strongly, strongly encourage you to do. Find some time over the next week as you're jumbling, as, as you're sort of juggling everything else that you're doing uh, to go out and use that, find that document if you haven't uh, accessed it yet on the course website that uh, provides some guidance for the final exam. It's over here. Um, where did I put it? Oh, there it is right there. There's a link. If you click on that link, it'll take you to this link to the document, some guidance for your final exam preparations. Take that document, print it out if you want to, okay? Figuratively, anyway, take that document in one hand, take your class notes from the entire semester, 
in the other hand, the textbook also in the other hand, your third hand, kind of use that document that I prepared for you, this guidance document, to go back through your notes and find information that is likely, that's, that's subject to testing on the final exam, okay? And think about that information and come back next week, Tuesday and Thursday of next week, prepared to ask questions over any of that material that you want further explanation, further elaboration, clarification, clearing things up. I want you all to do well on the final exam. I've never given, uh, I've never even taken a single class meeting uh, to do a review for the final exam, much less two. <laughs> so it's really going to depend on you though. We may have to take part of next week, next Tuesday's class meeting to make some concluding comments on civil rights. I don't know. We'll see how that flushes out this week. Okay, but as I see it right now, at least the bulk of the class meeting on Tuesday and certainly the class meeting on Thursday, I plan to just sort of, you know, wait for you all to hit me with your questions. I'm certainly not, it, it can't be one of those deals where you say, well, you know, um, I don't understand, you know, X, and then there's a sort of an expectation that I re-lecture that material. Right. Obviously, we can't do that, but if you can identify specific pieces of information that you want clarification on, specific information that you want further explanation on, um, you might want to um, certainly don't focus exclusively, but since we had that week uh, with the freeze uh, where we, you know, sort of wiped out that week, uh, we didn't actually have class meetings that week. We had some video material that you were supposed to go back and look at. Maybe that would be some material that you would want further clarification on, right? So, uh, because that is subject to the final, you know, questions on the final exam. So, um, it's uh, as I said, though, it's really going to depend on you because um, how productive those class sessions might be where we're you know, so you'll certainly come in and take your quizzes on Tuesday and Thursday of next week, right? You're going to be here anyway. You might as well come with questions about stuff that we've covered over the course of the semester. Again, either from class sessions or from reading material. Okay? Does that sound like a good use of the class sessions next week? Yes, ma'am. Um, when we do the final exam, is it going to be on paper? Because yeah, no, it's definitely not going to be on the screen. It'll, I'll pass out test booklets and you'll need to bring a Scantron form with you. I'm glad you asked that because I um, might not have remembered to say, you know, say that on my own. I would think I, you know, would hope I would, but you'll need to bring one of the Scantron forms, the longer Scantron forms that have 50 items. I think they have 50 items on the front and 50 items on the back, but it's a 50 item multiple choice question, so I need at least, you know, 50 on the front. Okay. And I've got a form number somewhere. If you'll remind me on uh, either Thursday or maybe sometime next week, one of the class sessions, I'll actually put it up on the screen so that you can see what it looks like. And how long do we have? Well, um, the department places a limit of an hour on it. So it's 50 multiple choice questions. My experience in, since I've been here at WCJC, We've been doing this departmental final exam, um, and most students finish in 20 minutes or so. You know, I mean, it's just not something that people take a lot of time with. Now, having said that, all, the only reason I'm saying 20 minutes is because I want to, you know, help you relax a little bit that you're going to have plenty of time to finish the final exam. But of course, any of you, if you want to stay the full 60 minutes, I'm happy to let you stay the full 60 minutes and and think very carefully about how you want to answer those questions. It seems like for some people, the main goal is just to get it over with and get, you know, get out. And that's why I think some people, sometimes I'm shocked by how quickly people finish a 50 item multiple choice test, you know, like it, they might hand it to me in seven minutes, you know, but on average, I think it's about 20, around 20 minutes that people take on the final exam. And it's on, it's going to be covering everything in the thing. That. Yeah, I mean, the easiest way to answer that is just say every anything that we covered in reading material or lecture material from the beginning of the semester, but that's a lot of stuff, and that's why I put together that document for you. You can kind of use that document to go through and 
and you, I don't know if you can maybe use it as a checklist or something. I have a good understanding. Here, let's actually look and see what that document looks like. So, you know, um, do I have a good understanding of how the process for amending the Constitution works? Right? Oh, I can check that off. Yeah, I understand that. that uh, or maybe you want to come in in week 15 and ask some questions about that, ask some very specific questions about that. So it's organized around the SLOs. The final exam is organized around the best for student learning objectives. So it's organized around the SLOs. And, you know, if you can cover these bases, and again, that looks like a lot, but it, it doesn't look like as much as if you just say everything from the beginning of the semester. <laughs> I mean, that's, this is, a, as I said at the very beginning of the semester, a pretty ambitious course. It's, what I see it is a pretty ambitious course. So a comprehensive final is, a, you know, intimidating maybe for some, you know, like, wow, I got to go back and study all that again. Well, yes, in a sense you do, but, you know, maybe this document will help you out a little bit in that process. Okay, anything else you want to ask about there? Anybody online want to ask a question about that? It's pretty much the same for you guys. Uh, this document that you're looking at right now is certainly the same um, because the substance of the course is the same whether you're online or face-to-face. -face. The only differences lie in the administration of the final exam itself. And I'm going to put a document out there for you guys pretty soon about the administration of the final exam. Okay? Sounds good. All right. Okay. Well, if nobody has any questions or concerns, let me... Um, let me get out of this, and I'll tell you what, let's just do it this way. Today, we're going to begin the topic on civil rights, and, um, you know, I think really the starting point for any discussion on civil rights is to make sure that we all have a good, pretty good basic understanding of what the concept means. And I want to go back to something that I actually introduced in the material on civil liberties, which was the stuff that we were iced out of, right? But some of you I've seen, I've seen by going into Blackboard, look, some of you have dealt with that material from week five, okay? Some haven't, right? But for those of you who have already done this, should, this should look familiar to you, okay? Because I like to make the distinction between the concepts of civil liberties and civil rights, as do most authors of textbooks. That's why they have separate chapters. Right? The, our the textbook that we're using in this course, chapter four is the chapter on civil liberties, and chapter five is the chapter on civil rights. So obviously they're making that distinction. Okay? So <laughs> I guess the first comment I'd like to make is that through a good chunk of American history, those concepts, civil liberties and civil rights, were used virtually synonymously, interchangeably. Okay? But over time, their meanings have diverged, at least somewhat, okay? So that today, when we think about the concept of civil liberties, we're thinking about the personal freedoms that are guaranteed to the individual, and they take the form of negative constraints on the power of government. So for example, when we look at the Bill of Rights, and specifically we look at the First Amendment, which begins with the phrase, Congress shall make no law. That's a constraint on the power of government. And again, those of you who have done the week five material understand now that that phrase, Congress shall make no law, really doesn't just mean Congress. In many instances, in fact, in most contexts in the Bill of Rights, it means um, government at any level, national government, state government, local government, okay? But that sort of specific issue aside, we'll just set that aside, you know, the idea here is that these are things that government can't do. Yeah, you have a right of free speech, but, but that right of free speech is protected against what? Against the power of government, right? Yeah, you have the right of free worship, but that right of free worship is protected against what? Oh, the power of government, right? Yeah, you have the right to peaceably assemble, but that right is protecting so, oh, the power of government, okay? And that's the way we think about the provisions of the Bill of Rights, those civil liberties rights 
that are indicated in the first 10 amendments of the Constitution and extended to protection against state and local authority by the due process clause of the 14th amendment. Okay. Civil liberties rights indicate what government can't do. Right? There are negative constraints on the power of government. What can't, what can't government do? Oh, it can't make an official religion. It can't abridge the right of free speech. It can't uh, abridge the right of the people to keep and bear arms. It can't abridge, right, you know, those civil liberties rights. Okay? So they declare what the government cannot do. Civil rights, on the other hand, have come to take, in, have, have come to take on a little bit different meaning in the modern context, really beginning in the post-Civil War period, but throughout the 20th century and down to today, we tend to think about civil rights more in the context of the powers or privileges that are guaranteed to the individual and protected against arbitrary removal, not only by government, but by other individuals or institutions. So whereas traditionally we have thought about civil rights like the right to vote, the right to a jury trial in criminal cases, right to counsel and so on, today we also think about civil rights very much in the context of the objectives of laws that further those values and particularly the value of equality. When we think about civil rights in the, in the contemporary context, in the modern context in the United States, something in our brains goes click, 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 click. Oh yeah, what we're really talking about here is equality among individuals without regard to race, color, gender, etc. So as I've indicated here as an example, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more detail as we go through this topic on civil rights, but just briefly for now, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 furthers the value of equality by establishing prohibitions against discrimination in public accommodations and employment practices. So the basic difference between the contemporary understanding of civil liberties and the contemporary understanding of civil rights concerns the orientation of government. Again, with civil liberties, we're thinking about things that the government can't do, cannot do. With civil rights, it suggests an affirmative role for government, right? That government must take affirmative action in order to do what? In order to promote equality without regard to race, gender, etc. Okay? So the example here that I've used, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, would be consistent with that, right? Because Congress passed that legislation in 1964 and essentially told, as I said, we're going to get into some detail on it, but it essentially told operators of businesses that are open to the public, like restaurants and hotels and transportation systems and so on. You cannot deny service on the basis of race. And if you do, you're subject to the penalties of federal law. Government is actually doing something rather than not doing something. You see the difference there? That Congress is taking up positive or affirmative action in order to promote the value of equality. Okay, questions about that basic distinction? So, you know, with that in mind, I think it's also important to understand that whether we're talking about civil liberties or civil rights, the Constitution is key, <laughs> right? That, you know, we're talking about an understanding of rights of individuals at a constitutional level, okay?
just to sort of further drive home the point, though, about the difference between civil liberties and civil rights, um, we oftentimes associate civil rights with particular segments of society that had been or maybe still are um, discriminated against in some sort of systematic way. Okay. So as I've indicated here, when Jefferson wrote those hallowed words in the Declaration of Independence that all persons are created, he actually said all men are created equal, right? But to be gender nonspecific, all persons are created equal, it was an abstract idea, right? Jefferson certainly wasn't saying in 1776 that all human beings are treated equally, right? And I think a good chunk of our history in the United States can be understood as an effort to move from that abstraction, that ideal that's expressed by Jefferson way back in 1776 to practice, right? That a good chunk of our history can be explained in terms of an effort to extend the promise of equality that Jefferson embraced in the Declaration of Independence to all individuals in our society without regard to some arbitrary characteristics like race or gender. Indeed, you know, the civil rights movements of the last 100 years or so would demonstrate that. You know, we've had, going back to the early and mid 19th century, in fact, an abolitionist movement. We had not one, but really two black civil rights movements, which we're going to talk about in some detail as we go along. We had in the middle part of the 20th century, in the 1960s, certainly in the 1970s, the Chicano movement, which was an effort to promote greater equality for um, Americans of Mexican heritage, specifically, but more generally Latino. Asian American rights movement in the 1960s and the 1970s. Native American rights movement of the same period. More recently, whoops, I skipped ahead. Um, going back to the early part of the 19th century, um, the women's rights movement and then in the 20th century as well, and now into the 21st century. But what I started to say was more recently, you've had a similar sort of effort to promote equality without regard to sexual orientation. Right? So the LBGT movement from the late 1960s really to the present. So again, all I'm really trying to suggest here is you have these se segments of society, these groups in our society that historically or contemporaneously have been systematically discriminated against and the movements that arose to promote civil rights on the behalf of individuals who belong to these groups is often articulated in terms of the struggle for equality. And in each case, the expectation has been that government has got to do something. Government can't just sit back and do nothing. The, the leaders of the black civil rights movement, the leaders of the Latino rights movement and the women's rights movement and so on, all, and, and as I say more recently, gay and lesbian uh, activists, uh, almost to the person, expect some sort of positive action on the part of government to promote equality. Okay, so questions about any of that? Now look, you know, this is a big topic. Like everything that we cover in this course this semester, we're going to have to be choosy about what we cover. And with apologies to any of you who may have a special interest in women's rights issues or gay and lesbian rights issues or any other uh, group, you know, we just don't really have the time to cover all of that in class, and I'm going to defer and refer you to 
the chapter in the textbook, at least initially, on civil rights, and maybe you can go from there with your own reading, right? Um, if you're interested in the history of women's rights or the future of women's rights or you know any of these other groups. I, in the interest of time, to get really to the point, what I'm trying to say is that uh, because of the limitation that we have, just a couple of class meetings to cover this, I'm going to focus on the issue of race. Because I think, frankly, that really has been the gut issue in American history. <laughs> and it, you know, if we can get a good basic understanding of that issue, it certainly um, provides the basis for understanding the other areas as well. Okay? All right, so let's begin with the Constitution, as I think we pro you know, properly should. I think it is worth noting that the United States Constitution, written when? You should know this by now, right? When was the Constitution drafted? 1787, the summer of 1787, right? The document that came out of that convention in Philadelphia in September of 1787. Um, did not make any direct mention of the institution of slavery or the slaves. In fact, there are really only two indirect references. Okay, The first is in Article 1, Section 2. This is the famous three-fifths compromise provision of the Constitution. You probably learned about that in your American history course. Right? There was a debate over in, in, at the convention, there was a debate over whether slaves should be counted as part of the population for the purposes of enumeration in the census, right, which would have, in turn, an effect on representation in the United States House of Representatives and the apportionment of taxes among the states. Okay, now, make this real simple for you, a 50-50 proposition, right? Which, generally speaking, which states wanted the slaves to be counted as part of the population? North or South? Northern states or Southern states wanted the slaves to be counted as part of the population? The South. The South. The Southern states wanted the slaves to be counted as part of the population. Why? It would increase the population of those states and therefore what? More Give reps. them more represent, representatives in Congress, right? And the northern states did not want the slaves to be counted, right? Okay? Because in a, in a sense, a good part of this debate is over who has more influence in the House of Representatives, okay? Right? So that was settled with this infamous compromise that slaves would be counted as three-fifths of a person for the purposes of enumerating the census. Okay? The second indirect reference comes in Article 1, Section 9, says the migration or importation of such persons as any of the states now existing shall think proper to admit shall not be prohibited by Congress prior to the year 1808. In other words, they're writing into the Constitution a provision that says Congress cannot make any laws restricting the slave trade any sooner than 1808. So, in other words, they're putting it off for 20 years. Any, any, any of you know why they work this provision into the Constitution? Which states, which delegates at the convention, the delegates from which state at the Constitutional Convention might have worried about a new Constitution that would untie the hands of Congress. Remember what we've talked about previously, how limited Congress's powers were under the Articles of Confederation, but then this new Constitution has these provisions in it which some of the opponents of the Constitution fear, right, that this was going to make it possible for Congress to do anything, right, like just go go wild, and maybe they'll even go so wild as to pass a law that prohibits or severely restricts the slave trade. So who would have wanted that provision in the Constitution? 
again, the, the delegates from the southern states, largely the, the slaveholding states. It's not, it's not so neat, you know, as to say, well, all of the, you know, representatives or all of the delegates from the southern states wanted it and all of the delegates from the northern states didn't want it, but it's a sort of a general way to divide, right? Okay, but again, these are really just sort of indirect or passing references. Now, I have a question for you, okay? Why didn't they choose to address the institution of slavery directly? Now, uh, let me ask that question a little bit differently. It won't appear on the screen like Cowan did, but here's a different, a different way to think about that question. Do you know if, or maybe you can just use your imagination, were there any, among that, those delegates to the Constitutional Convention, or more generally the framers, the founders of our system, right? Were there any who were opposed to slavery and who might have, if they could have, on their own, if they had had the power on their own to do so, might have just abolished slavery? Was there any opposition to slavery among the white power elite there at the Constitutional Convention? see at least one person, two people now, three people kind of nodding, yes, there were those. Do you know any names, people that we might refer to who condemned slavery or who thought that slavery was an immoral institution or that it should be abolished or anybody have a guess what may, might be a good? Did Jefferson want to keep slavery? You know, Jefferson's an interesting case as some of you probably know, Jefferson, his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, we go back to 1776. When, when was the Constitution written? 1787, right? A dozen years before that, 13 years to be precise before that, Jefferson wrote a little document called the Declaration of Independence. And some of you may be aware that in his original draft of the Declaration of Independence, right? You know, he, he gets to the part of the document where he starts pointing his finger at George III and listing all the grievances that the colonists have against George III. And he gets to this one where he writes, he, meaning George III, has waged cruel war against human nature itself, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, cap uh, captivating and carrying them into slavery into another hemisphere or to incur miserable death in their transportation thither, this practical warfare, and so on. I'm not going to read the whole passage here. If you're interested, you can go out and just, just Google Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration of Independence. You can read this passage yourself. But he's pretty, he's pretty, it's a pretty scathing criticism, of course, pinning it all on George III, which is not, you know, probably maybe somewhat disingenuous, right? But it is a reflection of Jefferson's moral opposition to slavery. Now, I started to say, as some of you know, Jefferson was quite a complicated individual. He was an enigma. And uh, someone might say, well, but Fagan didn't, wasn't Jefferson a slaveholder? Yes, he was. <laughs> he was, in fact, a slaveholder. In fact, many of our founders had complicated views on this issue. For example, here's a list of founding fathers, quote unquote, who didn't own slaves and expressed opposition to the institution of slavery. John Adams, for example, never owned slaves um, and supported only gradual abolition of slavery. In fact, Adams, John Adams employed both white and freed blacks in his home as servants, paying them wages. Samuel Adams advocated an end to the slave trade, his second cousin. Thomas Paine advocated abolition of slavery and later was a member of the Pennsylvania Society for promoting the abolition of slavery and the relief of free Negroes unlawfully held in bondage. Roger Sherman expressed personal opposition to slavery, thought it was a moral travesty 
but did not actively oppose slavery for the rest of the country, although he did advocate for the end of the slave trade. Here's a guy, some of you may have heard of John Jay, owned slaves and supported something called manumission. Anybody know what that refers to? Did you learn about that in your American history course? As opposed to abolition, manumission was the voluntary release of slaves by slave owners. He thought that slave owners should just voluntarily do it, whereas abolition suggests government mandating the end of it, right? Thomas Jefferson, as we said, condemned slavery in the Declaration of Independence, but continued to own slaves throughout his life. He supported gradual abolition as well in a policy called colonization. That was a policy that would return former slaves to Africa. Jefferson also wanted to free his slaves upon his death, but one of the things that maybe we don't learn too much about in our American history classes is that Jefferson, like many of our founding fathers, died in great debt. Jefferson was in huge debt, and since slaves were considered property, um, his people he owed money to could claim that property. Patrick Henry also owned slaves, described it as a lamentable evil, but and wrote. I will not, I cannot justify owning slaves, but apparently he was conflicted enough or not conflicted enough to actually free any of his slaves. And then just the last one on my list, again, in part, just because I ran out of space, <laughs> um, is John Marshall, who argued that slavery was contrary to the laws of nature but that didn't stop him from owning slaves. So there were certainly at least a handful, to get back to the original point, there were certainly at least a handful. By the way, I used to have Alexander Hamilton on this list under a heading, Supported Abolition of Slavery. But there's been some recent scholarship that has cast some doubt on how Hamilton should be classified on the question of slavery, um, arguing that there's a lot of evidence that uh, Hamilton uh, owned household slaves, previously un, really unknown evidence. At any rate, Hamilton aside, all of these individuals aside, I just picked a few people that I thought you might recognize their names, and you can see that there's a range of of views here on this institutional I mean, of course, many of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention, particularly from the South, would have been outright uh, 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 supporters of the institution of slavery, you know, opposed to abolishing slavery. Okay. At any rate, there certainly were at least a few individuals who would have, could have, to get back to the original point, abolished slavery. As early as 1776. <laughs> But certainly in 1787, it seems that that would be the case. Now, why then, you know, why not do it? By the way, you know, think about Jefferson's original draft here in this passage that I have highlighted. That passage, of course, was deleted by the other members of the Continental Congress. It didn't make it into the final draft of the Declaration of Independence. And by most reports, Jefferson didn't put up too much of a fight as they took that out, which makes one wonder, well, why? Well, you may remember I've told you in previous class meetings going back a number of weeks that now I'm talking specifically about the Declaration of Independence. 
okay, that the independence question, that motion when it was introduced by Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, the way that the Continental Congress worked is any resolutions had to carry by unanimous vote. And it seems very likely that if Jefferson had insisted, no, you're not taking that passage out of this document, that at least one, probably, uh, you know, several southern colonies would have rejected the independence resolution. I think to be I think to be as simple about it as I can and as honest, plainly honest about it as I can, I think Jefferson was an idealist in some ways, but he was also very pragmatic. And he understood that if the independence resolution failed, all, uh, all other causes were lost. <laughs> that, you know, sort of first things first, let's get independence done and worry about the rest later. So, you know, I think Jefferson allowed that to be removed from the Declaration of Independence. Well, then we get, you know, 13 years later, we get to the Constitutional Convention, and there's still no direct mention of slavery. There's just these two sort of indirect references. There's certainly no real effort to abolish slavery. Um, and again, I think that it's a realization on the part of those who might have found the institution of slavery morally reprehensible that, you know, again, it's not very satisfying to us today, but, you know, first things first, we got to get this constitution done, right? Because in very much the same way, if um, stronger language about slavery had put in, been put into the original constitution, it probably couldn't have been adopted. It certainly couldn't have been ratified at the, by the states. Okay. All right, well, let's fast forward to the Civil War period, because it is not until after the Civil War that we do get language put into the Constitution that directly deals with the institution of slavery and its legacy, okay? So the Civil War amendments, as they're sometimes called, include the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. The 13th Amendment, which was added to the Constitution in 1865, prohibits slavery in the United States. I'm going to jump to the 15th Amendment, come back to the 14th. The 15th Amendment, added in 1870, established the right of citizens to vote regardless of race, creed, color, or previous condition of servitude. And the 14th Amendment, which has got several things in it that are really important, we've previously dealt, or at least those of you who did the week five material already on civil liberties, you know the importance of the 14th Amendment due process clause. But the part of the 14th Amendment that we're particularly interested in in any discussion of civil rights is the so-called equal protection clause. It's the provision that says, nor shall any state deprive citizens of their rights under the Constitution or deny equal protection of the laws. In fact, let's look at the specific language of the 14th Amendment. I thought I had that linked up, but maybe I don't. There we go. Okay. So the 14th Amendment has five sections. And we're mainly interested in sections one and five, right? Okay? Look at the look at the language of the, four, the section one of the Fourteenth Amendment. It says all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. I wonder why, in 1868, the framers of the Fourteenth Amendment thought that it was necessary to put language into the Constitution establishing that any person born in the United States or um, naturalized in the United States, what does that term naturalized mean? It's the process that, not, it's certainly not just 
a period of time. It's the process that immigrants go through, people who come from other countries go through in order to become American citizens. It's called naturalization. If you are born in the United States, you're automatically a citizen. But if you immigrate to the United States, you have to go through a process, right? But I think one of the things that this says is that there's no preferential status given to those who are born here over those who are naturalized as American citizens, right? That's one of the things that we can draw from this provision of the Constitution. So somehow people who are native born citizens don't have some special status over those who are naturalized. They're both equally citizens of the United States. But more to the point that I'm really trying to get to here is it says, are citizens of the United States and of the state in which they reside. You see, up until this time, states pretty much determined who was a citizen and who was not a citizen. And if the states could determine who's a citizen and who's not a citizen, that, mean, that meant that they could determine who is afforded citizenship rights and who's not going to get citizenship rights. And frankly, the framers of the 14th Amendment in 1868 were afraid that some states, particularly the former Confederate states, might use that authority to deprive the former slaves of full citizenship status and therefore full citizenship rights. That's really the motivation of that provision of the 14th Amendment. Very clearly the motivation of that provision. Okay. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. That's called the Privileges and Immunities Clause, which is a very important provision of the Constitution as well. Nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That's how all those civil liberties rights, the right of free speech, the right of free worship, the right to keep and bear arms, and so on, which are directed at the power of Congress. Congress shall make no law is now understood to mean states and local governments as well. So just like the national government can't deprive you, abridge your right of free speech, neither can the state of Texas or the city of Sugarland. That's the importance of that clause right there. And why I introduced that, the authors of your textbook introduced that in chapter four in the topic on civil liberties. But now we're interested in this, okay? Nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. And we know what motivated, historically, what motivated this provision of the Constitution. It, is, it was a concern on the part of the framers of the 14th Amendment that states, particularly the former Confederate states, the southern states, would use their lawmaking authority to deprive the former slaves of full equality. There's no question that that's what the motivation was of the 14th Amendment. And on top of all that, they add Section 5, which says Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. So we really see the beginnings of this expectation. This is where we started today. The be we see the beginnings of this expectation that government's going to have to do something. All right? By after the Civil War, the framers of the 14th Amendment realized that racial equality is not going to just happen. It's not just going to magically somehow that we're going to free the slaves and somehow that people are just magically going to treat each other equally and fairly and not, you know, without regard to race. The government is actually going to have to take some action, some positive steps. When I say positive, I mean in the sense of actually doing something. Okay, so these are the two important provisions of the 14th Amendment. As I said, I don't want to diminish the significance of the 13th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. All I'm really saying, they are terribly important. All I'm really saying is that this is really the provision. When we talk about the struggle for civil rights and equality, and particularly racial equality in our society, we are zeroed in on the Equal Protection Clause. Because that's what, what it all hinges on. What that phrase, equal protection of the laws, requires. 
Well, again, I want you to think about this provision of the Constitution right here. Okay? We have said earlier in the semester that the theory of the Constitution is that no branch of the national government, Congress, the president of the court, has any power except that which is delegated to it by the Constitution, right? In fact, we've said that fairly recently. Tried to drive that point home fairly recently. Okay? So whatever powers Congress has, whatever powers the president has, whatever powers the courts have must at least be based in the Constitution. So what the framers of the 14th Amendment are doing here is providing a basis in the Constitution for Congress to act affirmatively, for Congress to undertake power to do what? To promote racial equality, to promote civil rights. It's not going to just happen by itself. Okay? They understood that. Okay? And the evidence of that is that in the years following the passage of, or in the, in the years following the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, Congress undertook a very progressive, I think we'd have to say, civil rights agenda. I think, hold on, I'm going to take this off for a minute so you don't get too busy writing, okay? If we were to take a survey and ask a thousand randomly selected Americans, when was the black civil rights movement, you know, what period of our history was the black civil rights movement, what would people say? What would be your guess? The middle part of the 20th century, right? Okay. Well, and that would be true. There was a very important black civil rights movement during the middle part of the 20th century. But it wasn't the first black civil rights movement. This is the part that many Americans don't see about their history. There was a black civil rights movement almost a century earlier. And so I like to call it the first congressional civil rights agenda. So in this 10-year period of Reconstruction, between 1866 and 1875, large Republican majorities in Congress passed several civil rights acts to enforce the provisions of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. These civil rights statutes authorized the federal government to impose heavy penalties for violations. Now, the next few slides I'm going to run through pretty quickly, and you're not going to have time to transcribe all the information on the screen. Okay, so what I recommend that you do is just try to get the gist of what is involved with these. At least write down, maybe write down the name of the legislation, okay, and then you can go just Google it, you know, to get a more complete set, you know, if you want more complete information. But I'm gonna, I, because in the interest of time, I'm just going to run through these, okay? If you have questions, I'm happy to stop and try to answer any questions you, that you might have, okay? You'll have to understand that I'm not really a historian, so I may not be able to answer the historical questions. Okay, so the Civil Rights Act of 1866. You know, maybe just the name, if you're jotting stuff down, maybe the name of the act and then the stuff in blue would get you the gist of it, right? So the Civil Rights Act of 1866 granted black citizens equal rights to contract, to enter into contracts to sue and to be sued, to marry, to travel, and to own property. It made citizens subject to, quote, like punishment, pains, and penalties. Any person guilty of depriving citizens of their stated rights because of race, color, or previous condition of servitude could be fined, imprisoned, or both. Can you imagine living in a society where, at least up to this point, based on race, you couldn't get married? Or you couldn't enter into contracts? Marriage is a contract, right? Couldn't own property? Well, that was the situation that existed in many states, and Congress is saying, not anymore. the Reconstruction Act of 1867. This act allowed former slaves to participate fully in the political arena. As a result, African Americans were able to hold elective offices. For example, 
many African Americans sat in state constitutional conventions and state legislatures. In fact, there was at least one state during the Reconstruction period, South Carolina, where African Americans, former slaves, held a majority of the seats in the state legislature. In Texas, for example, there were former slaves who sat at the Constitutional Convention that drafted the 1869 Texas Constitution. There are two things that happened here that facilitated that outcome you don't see on the screen. Okay? First of all, after the Civil War, during the Reconstruction period, former slaves were enfranchised. Do you know what that term means? We talk about this a lot in the 2306 course. We haven't really talked about it in this course yet, but we should at least know what that word means, to be enfranchised. That was when they were given money and land. No, no, not talk, enfranchised means, no, no. It just, it means, it refers to the right to vote. Right? Those, those things are also true. That happened during Reconstruction, but this term enfranchised specifically refers to given the right to vote. Right? So for the first time, former slaves now have the right to vote, and at the same time former slaves were being enfranchised, Confederates, those who had undertaken open rebellion against the government of the United States, were disenfranchised. And so we're talking about whites. You had a large number of African Americans, former slaves who were enfranchised, and a large number of whites who were disenfranchised in the South. And that meant that, for example, in South Carolina, the result was a state legislature with a majority of the seats held by former slaves. But it was temporary. <laughs> This piece here, participated in the development of new comprehensive programs for state education in the South. The public education system in the South is largely the result of this. The development of the public education system in the South. The Enforcement Act of 1870. This act stated that all citizens otherwise qualified to vote in any election should not be denied the right to vote on the basis of race. So the 15th Amendment guarantees the right to vote without regard to race, but again, they understand that just because you have this provision written in the Constitution now doesn't mean that it magically happens that somehow Congress is going to have to take action to promote it, and that comes in the form of this Enforcement Act of 1870. The Civil Rights Act of 1871. This act set up a system of federal supervision of elections within the states in order to stop illegal voter registration practices. You remember earlier in the semester when we talked about, oh no, it was in the 2306 course, I, re, I retract that. We were talking about the Voting Rights Act of 1965, but we'll talk about it probably in Thursday's class meeting, okay? The Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. This act was intended to protect black citizens against intimidation by illegal actions by groups such as the KKK in cases where the states could not or would not provide protection. In other words, the federal government is saying if the state of Mississippi won't protect its citizens against racial terrorism, the federal government will do it. Or any state, I just picked Mississippi as an example. All right, and the last one on my list.
is the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Now, this is a very important act of Congress that we're going to spend a little bit more time on than we did the previous ones. Okay. And we're almost out of time for today, so we're not going to get very far with it, but I at least want to introduce this law to you. Okay. So Congress passes this act in 1875, right at the end of the Reconstruction period. Reconstruction runs basically from 1865 to 1875. And notice, by the way, down here, this last sentence. Let's jump to the bottom first. This is the last piece of civil rights legislation that was passed by the United States Congress for 80 years. There wouldn't be another one for, another, for 80 years, almost a century. When Reconstruction came to an end, it came to an end. Right? When Reconstruction came to an end, the effort on the part of the United States Congress to promote racial equality came to a dramatic end. So the legislation entitled all persons the, quote, full and equal enjoyment of public accommodations. Now that term public accommodations, you got to understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about enterprises that are open to the public. Hotels, restaurants, theaters, places of amusement, etc. Okay. These things in the United States of America are generally owned by private entrepreneurs, by private individuals. The government doesn't own and operate hotels. The government doesn't own and operate restaurants, either the national government nor the state government. So we're talking about private individuals. What Congress is saying here in 1875 then is that private individuals who operate businesses that are open to the public cannot discriminate on the basis of race. They can't deny entry to the theater. They can't deny table in a restaurant. They can't deny any service on the basis of race lest they incur the penalties of federal law. So I don't know if that surprises you or not to learn that as long ago as 1875, Congress was passing legislation that was attempting to prevent private individuals from discriminating on the basis of race. So what happened? Why did this civil rights agenda come to an end? We'll, we'll finish on this point for today and then we'll come back and talk in more detail about the Civil Rights Act of 1875 next time. Okay? Well, one thing that we would point to is that by the time Reconstruction is coming to an end, what does that mean, by the way? Well, one thing that it means is that those former Confederates who I told you a little bit earlier that were disenfranchised, whites who actively rebelled against the United States during the Civil War, Reconstruction comes to an end and they are re-enfranchised. So when whites regain their right to vote in the South, and the right to hold office in the South by 1875, the old white power structure comes back to dominate again. And in Congress, whereas during the Reconstruction period, we saw these, I've showed you these numbers previously, remember? Right, where we saw these huge Republican majorities in Congress, both the House and the Senate, during the Reconstruction period. Notice that with the 44th Congress, you see you have these huge Republican majorities all the way from 1865 to 1875. When we get to the 44th Congress, you're back to divided government. And so the Reconstruction era, the legislative agenda of the Reconstruction era, the first black civil rights movement, comes to a screeching halt. Number one, because the politics now no longer supported it. Okay? But there's also something um, that we've got to address in some real depth on Thursday, and that is the role of the United States Supreme Court. So we're going to talk about the civil rights cases of 1883, okay, which directly 
address the Civil Rights Act of 1875. I also uh, indicated here, there's a bullet hit point here. Let, let me don't just skip over it. We'll um, just wrap up on this point. Uh, there also are civil rights leaders, black civil rights leaders, namely Booker T. Washington, who are beginning to advocate um, an approach uh, where African Americans accept social inequality. Right? In his very famous Atlanta Compromise Address, Booker T. Washington called for black progress through education and entrepreneurship rather than trying to challenge segregation laws. Now he was met with some, um, some black civil rights leaders in that era challenged his approach, but it was certainly an approach which most of the white community um, who thought of themselves at that time as progressive and supporting you know, opportunities for African Americans were much more comfortable with back in the late 19th and early 20th century, um, Booker T. Washington's approach, I'm saying, right? Was seen as less radical by most of the people in the white community. And so that sort of came to dominate for a period of time the um, efforts to promote equality for African Americans, okay? All right, so we're just out of time. We're gonna have to end on that point. We will come back the first thing right out of the gate on uh, Thursday. I want to start talking about the role of the court because the court's, the court's uh, decisions in the area of civil rights are critical. Okay? All right. We'll see you on uh, Thursday.